We try to record hey, the session. Hey, it worked. It worked. It worked. It's recording. So you're good to go. Now, the reason why we did this was not not to give you for even more work than you already have. And I want to commend you four weeks classes online. You are brave people. But you've been doing a good job. We're one week away. And so we're going to surprise you, right? We're going to give you a surprise, right? Uh, papers are going to be due now. Um, July 7th. 7th. Write that down. Everybody Write that down. Seven. <laughs> Look at Joe. Seven. <laughs> Look at Joe. So seven. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Joe's like, thank you, please. I can enjoy That's my fourth of July. Too. Yeah, right. That's for us too. We don't no, want to grade your papers all the time. We do. We do that. I do that every summer because these sessions, these four week sessions, these five week sessions, they can take a toll on the students. I mean, and by the end of the session, students are tired and exhausted, and you don't get the quality of work that you were looking for as a professor. And those additional five days gives you a chance to kind of really think through. You're not thinking about the exams anymore. You're not thinking about the voice threads or, or the extra credits. And do the extra credit by all means. We're gonna we're gonna give you extra credits, okay? So write it down, July seventh. You can upload your two papers, and you know that gives you an additional five days. All right. And you're oh. the first class that we've told us. Yeah, to. you're the so first if, one. Somebody, if somebody else, else is like, down. yeah, if somebody else is like, no, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Well, it's true. It's really true. We're going to send it out. We're going to send it out when we're done with this session. Yep. So real quick, um, uh, we do this for a reason. I wanted to do the Zoom. In the old days, the Skype system, right, which is a good system also, is because um, online education can be quite static. You know, you get assignments, you do your assignments, and you don't really get to interact with your classmates. You don't really get to interact anyway. And so the Zoom system and the voice thread has, in my opinion, has really kind of brought a little bit more of what we call um, synergy. Right versus the static education of online education. I understand that online education is very convenient. I get it. You're working, you're doing, you have your commitments, your family, whatever, but we're trying to give you more of a positive experience, not just, okay, I took that online class and I did my homework and I was done and I really didn't get anything from it because I just did my homework and I was done and I never interacted with anybody. You know. So we're hoping that this session will kind of bring a little. Obviously, it's not face-to-face. -face. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And what we're going to talk about today is, um, first things first, is, we want to know, um, and Martha, you kind of participated in this last year when you were in the 3250 as a TA. Um, where have you been? Where would you like to go? I mean, this is families and global perspective. Where have you been, even if it's just in America, and where would you like to go? Or maybe you traveled in other places. Maybe your family's military, whatever the case. So um, remember, when you want to talk, make sure you turn on your mic, okay? So who wants to go first? Well, let's see, uh, Reina, you're, let's go with Reina yeah, first Reina. because of battery, right? <laughs> go ahead, Reina. It's all yours, Reina. She's trying to unmute. I Reina know it's unmute. tricky. There you okay. Go. Okay. Now I got the hot seat. Okay. So the question was, where have I been or where do I want to go? Where have yeah, you been? Have what? you been somewhere in America? Or I America? have been nowhere besides from Vegas, which is pretty sad. Um, <laughs> um, I plan to do a lot of. <laughs> I, I plan to do a lot of traveling. Um, I really uh, inspire to go to a Spanish-speaking country. Uh, porque esto, estoy aprendiendo español. Ah, muy bien, muy bien. Um, aquí, pero um, it, that's a really big passion of mine is to learn, learn more about my gente and also um, learn, uh, I'm a, um, currently undergoing a genealogy testing, so I want to learn more about my uh, native roots and possibly visit um, South America. And uh, there you go, see some Incan ruins, go to Mexico, see the Mayan stuff, and just kind of just get out and see a, see a lot of those uh, Latin cultures and Latin parts of the world. Do it, do it. I mean, next summer we're going in HDFR. The goal is knock on wood. Us in the Spanish department, we're going to go to Spain. So oh, wow. Main master. We're going to go to Spain for main master. We're going to do like service learning. But we're uh -huh. also gonna, the students are going to be exposed to learning Spanish. And then right. the second trip we want to take is not all in the same summer, of course. Not the second trip is we want to go to South America. Like maybe the oh, wow. Time, whatever the case. But we'll definitely keep you posted if you haven't graduated, right? I right. haven't graduated. I'm in my third year, you know, but I've, I've also got a full-time job at home with my family you know, and my kids. So it's not as easy as, you know, someone who doesn't have children to just pick up and leave and go study abroad. So unfortunately, I've got, got some barriers in between. Um, We'll send but I know there's another opportunity. Take the kids with you to Mexico. We'll send you to Mexico. Yes. <laughs> that's true. That's true. I shouldn't allow that to stop me. So definitely no, 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 want to make no. that a 
we commend you for, for being a, a hardworking student and all the commitments. We commend you. And listen, you can live those dreams. You can live those dreams. And uh, I think it's great that you have these goals. And I think you'll get there because you're driven. You get, you'll yeah, get absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yep, yep, Brenda. Go ahead. Who wants to go next? Connor, want to go next? Sure, I'll go next. Yeah. All right. So I actually, when I was 12, I lived in Madrid, Spain for a year. Um, oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah, with my family. We traveled all over Europe for the year. Um, and I've also lived in Ethiopia when I graduated from high school. Um, and I traveled all around Africa. So, and I've been, I just was in Nicaragua a couple weeks ago. So I've done a, a fair share of traveling, which has been so awesome just for my growth personally and personally and all that kind of stuff. Is that, more, that, that motivation, must that must motivate you to go to different countries? And, so yeah. What are your long-term goals and what do you want to do with it? Sorry. I'm hearing like a monster or something. No worries, no worries. Go ahead. Um, sorry, I can't hear you. What is my goal with that? Is that what you said? Yeah, what are your long-term goals? You've been traveling to all these different places. What yeah, are your goals? well, I, I love to travel. I want to continue to travel. I want my kids to travel. Yes, I want to make that something I integrate into my family because I feel like it really My brother and I just have um, grown up in our Is that someone's... Um, I think you turn off the bike. Lexi, will you turn on... Lexi, will you uh, will you uh, pause your mic? Yeah. Oh, we just lost her. We just lost Lexi. Okay. You there, Lexi? Thank you. All right, good. All right, Connor. So okay, sorry, I was really distracted. <laughs> tell us again, Connor. Tell us again. So anyway, I just um, I want to continue to travel. I love to travel, and it's grown my family, my brother and I, just into who we are because we've had lots of cultural experiences and. Um, I think just from being 12 and moving into a new country and, you know, different world, you just, we were forced to be independent and grow culturally and who we are and um, accept cultures better. And now I really am able to, when I travel, to experience the world differently and um, just see the world as, as such a huge place where there's so much to see and experience and cultures are different. And yeah, it's fascinating to me. So I want to continue to travel for sure. Great. Right. I commend you and keep doing it. Keep traveling. Yeah. Who wants to go next? Joe, you want to go next? Hi there. Um, so recently I've been traveling. I went to Vancouver, um, British Columbia. I went to Hawaii. And back in January, I went to the Azores. Um, and then last year, I went to the Cook Islands and New Zealand. And I just recently started traveling about four or five years ago. My family never really like to travel, they're homebodies. Um, so I've definitely just been going by myself and just, yeah, I love it. It really pushes me to get out there and be more social and meet all different types of people. So it's definitely been a lot of fun. Well, I commend you, Joey, and I think you've been something that's important. Uh, as uh, Americans, we tend to be homebodies, right? A lot of us don't travel beyond our regions. And I gave the example in the morning class where I had students in northern Ohio. We were about 50 miles, excuse me, 55 minutes from the Canadian border. And overwhelmingly, about 85% of my students had never been to the border to Canada. And oh, really? <laughs> though Canada was only about 55 minutes away. And it's this whole sense of homebody. It's also a sense of Americans. We get caught up in the whole idea that, well, America's the best. Why should I go anywhere else? Mm -hmm. and so I think in this class, our goal has been to try to expose you to different families, and different cultures across the world. But I'm glad, Joe, you're taking that step. Well, when I say taking it, you've taken that step. And you're <laughs> I respect where my family's at, but I want to go and do my, do my thing, right. for lack of better words. Absolutely. Right. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. How about you, Lexi? All right. Sorry, Dr. Ben. Um, so I missed the prompt. So are we talking about traveling? Yeah, where, where have you been? Traveled? Where have you been and where do you want to go? Uh, okay, so I haven't really ever been outside the United States like you were talking about. Um, I've been to like New Mexico, Michigan, places like that. I have family there. Um, I would I like to go. You because I love New Mexico and my wife's from Michigan, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, I would like to go outside the uh, United States. I'd like to go to Mexico and like New Zealand. New Zealand. I'd like to go places like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, thanks, Lexi. Thanks. And yes, yeah. make those plans. You're young. Go for it. Absolutely. Right. How about you, Martha? We lost one. No, you didn't. Hello. 
see it screams all everybody else in here. We can maybe do this. Can you see me? Oh, that's even better. We can see you now, Martha. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so my family is from El Salvador. And so um, ever since I was born, my family and I have gone to Central America and South America every year for holidays. Um, so I've, can you hear me? Are yeah. you having trouble? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're good. I'll tell you. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, I've been able to uh, see a lot of the countries in South America and Central America. Um, and last year I was able to go to uh, uh, Hungary um, for the summer. So I've seen a little bit of Europe. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I'd like to go places more, um, but I don't know where. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Martha. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Uh, I see Roxanne. Um, just there. You got it. You got it. I got it. Yeah. Okay. All right. You just asked us where we've traveled to. Yeah. And where would you like to go to? Um, I've traveled extensively over the United States on uh, drive. I've driven cross country several times and I haven't gone to many places, but I did live in New Zealand for a year. Um, so that was interesting. Stopped in Fiji and yeah, where would I like to go? Um, I'd like to plan a trip to France to practice my French. <laughs> it's a nice place. I've been to France. People are great. The stereotype that French don't like Americans. I didn't experience that. People were very positive to me, you know, very giving, very giving. People invited me to their house, and I was a nice. stranger. <laughs> stranger. Well, we wanted to start that to kind of get a sense of where you're at and a sense of travel, where you've been and where you want to go. Uh, one of the things we've been learning in this class, and us too, Jen, or Jennifer and I, is that this idea, when we taught this class last semester, and my colleague, uh, Dr. Trask, you, you got a chance to see her uh, TED Talk, during the regular semester, you actually read her book. But as Jen and I said, we spared you because the book is actually quite intense. And for four I, weeks, it's very difficult. What would you say, Jennifer? Oh, I was just going to say, I used it in the gender lecture. So they got a little taste of trash. You got, got a little, a little taste, taste of trash. trash. Yeah, and I got, to see, uh, I got to see Dr. Trash last week at, at the national conference, and she was excited that we're using her book, and she was talking to me about uh, global families. She's the leading scholar in America for global families. And I was talking to her about this whole idea, this whole notion that global societies and global, the global perspectives are still very much Western oriented versus non-Western. And I was talking to her about that. And, you know, she said, this has been for a long period. We're talking about 500 years now, roughly of the Western mentality. And the Western mentality is mostly, of course, Europe and Latin America and North America. Okay. And so in this class, we'll be trying to give you an exposure to obviously Western societies like, uh, for example, Dr. Nostraka. You read Dr. Nostraka's, uh, Dr. Nostraka's reading on Eastern families, right? Eastern European families. But at the same time, we need to understand that global perspectives take in not just Western philosophies. Now, obviously, the United States is a Western philosophy, but I've always tried to, to share with people is, why don't we learn about non-Western philo uh, philosophies and non-Western perspectives? And so today, we're going to talk about um, uh, parenting, the parenting process. And we were talking about this earlier in, um, in the uh, earlier session, and uh, we got in a good discussion about people's background, how that impacts their parenting, what your experiences are when you were growing up, uh, or if you're a parent already, uh, what it means to be a parent now versus what it was like when you grew up. So we're going to give you some basic concepts on the parenting processes, and we're going to give you some global perspectives on it. And of course, we'll tie it to the United States because we're in the United States. And so... Uh, Martha, you've been exposed to this because you've been uh, in the elementary education and, and you were in our class before. And there's three key parenting styles that are often brought up when we talk about the parenting process. Now, let's, from a, from a, from a terminology perspective, other countries might not call it an authoritarian parenting style, which is the oldest type of parenting style that we use in the world. It's the oldest and it's the most commonly used. Authoritarian parenting is based on a hierarchy where the, where the parent is here and the child is here. And usually when we talk about the parenting process, it's usually between the ages of zero to roughly adolescence or a little bit older, 18, 19, or 20 years old. Okay, 
So the authoritarian parenting style is this notion that the parent knows best and the parent makes the decisions based on his or her experiences in the environment. Now you have to take into consideration environmental factors such as social, cultural, religious factors. You have to take into consideration economic factors. You have to take into consideration the temperament of the children. And so the earlier I gave an example of France, uh, or I saying you were talking about France, and I talked about an adolescent who, who wants to go to a certain part of the neighborhood or a certain part of uh, Paris, and his parents said, we don't want you going there because we don't want you profiling you. No one profiling you. I was talking about an Algerian because you've had, an, you've had a high concentration of Algerians from Northern Africa come to France in the last 30 years. And so the parent tells the young man, we don't want you to go to that neighborhood because we don't want you to be profiled because they might stereotype you for the wrong reasons because of all the stereotypes of Algerians and Northern Africans right now in France. So the authoritarian parenting would be like, this is the way it is. We're not going to give you any options. We're not going to discuss it. This is why it is going to happen because we know best for you. The misconception about authoritarian parenting is this idea that it's only spanking. And it's not the case. The reality of it is a lot of parents are authoritarian and they don't spank. I myself am somewhere between authoritarian and authoritative, which I'll discuss in a minute. Um, but the authoritarian parenting is the, uh, it's the oldest type of parenting and it's the one that's mostly consistent in the world. Okay. Now, other parts of the world might call it strict parenting or traditional. And what the state students said earlier, military, military, parent, style. military style parenting. That's what one of the students was talking about earlier. Um, but authoritarian is parent-centered. And it's that notion that it's top down. The idea comes from the parent knows best for the child. Now, I tell people, you know, it really depends on the environment that the child's growing up. I talked about how I myself use authoritarian and, and authoritative. But the reason why I use authoritarian is because I myself, as you know, I'm Latino, I'm Mexican descent. My sons are growing up in a society where, generally speaking, 75 to 80 percent of society accepts uh, Latino males, but there is unfortunately that smaller percentage that continues to profile us and to stereotype us into negative aspects. And I would say the same thing for African American young men in this country. So the authoritarian parenting kicks in for me where I tell my sons, I know this because I've experienced this unfortunately, and I know based on what's going on in society. Uh, authoritative parenting is quite different. Authoritative parenting is based on the still top down from the adult to the child, but the child is explaining the consequences and the child actually has a voice in this parenting process. So let's go back to the young man in France. So if the young man in France says, I want to go to this neighborhood and Luke lives there. Luke, he's on my soccer team. You know him, you know his parents. Um, well, I'm going to be safe. No one's going to stereotype me. I'll be okay. And the parents sit down and they make a decision. Okay, we're still going to let, we're not going to let you go. Thanks for explaining about Luke. Or we are going to let you go. This is the difference between the authoritative and authoritarian parenting style. Okay? So it's still parent-centered. And the example that I give is that French example. It's important to know that this whole notion of profiling people. And uh, right now we're going through this in the United States, obviously, with what happened in Baltimore. Um, unfortunately, what just happened in South Carolina, uh, the gentleman, the extremist, he, uh, he killed it. Obviously, if you heard about it on your phone, on television, um, we know that profiling exists. So I always tell people, let, don't, don't stereotype authoritarian parents as they're too strict. This is the way it should be. A lot of the times authoritarian parents are doing it because they see something's going on in the world and they're trying to protect their children. Okay. Um, so I think when you look at authoritative parenting, which I think is probably the best balance, to be honest with you. And one of the students earlier in the session, she said that's probably the best balance. She had grown up, her parents were authoritarian to her, and then they were authoritative to her younger siblings. Now, the way I look at that is that her parents got more exposure. They learned more about what it means to be a parent. I'm still learning. I've been working with children since I started raising a little brother and sister when I was 12. But I officially got my first job in Parks and Rec when I was in high school. And then I worked with children all through my modern career. I'm still learning on how to be a better parent or better guardian or better teacher, I tell people. So the authoritative parenting, that holds a balance. So if you have that eight-year-old child, right? You have that eight-year-old child, 
and you explain to him or her the consequences of, of their actions, I think there is that sense of balance. But there has to be an environment conducive to that. I said earlier that if a person lives in a middle class urban area or a suburban area or a rural area, and the neighborhood generally is pretty safe and there's an environment for that child, like just their, their local parks or a backyard, these types of environments where the child is safe, then the authoritative parenting has been very successful in the United States. In particular with Anglo families, European American middle class families, most European American middle class families use the authoritative parenting styles. Uh, so there is that sense of authoritarian and authoritative. The third parenting style, which is I, it's child centered, not adult centered like the other two, it's called permissive parenting. And I'll be honest with you, I don't agree with this style of parenting. Although I'm not going to judge someone if they use it, I don't think it's as effective as the authoritative or the authoritarian or the combination of the other two. Uh, the permissive parenting is this notion that you're guiding the child. You're letting the child find his or her footing as they go along, and you're kind of guiding them. And I think to some extent, you have to talk about temperament. And I talked earlier about three types of temperament. Um, easy going where a child just comes in, and, or a young adolescent, uh, they come in and they just kind of adapt wherever they are. Uh, slow to warm up where um, it takes them a little warm up, but then once they get used to their environment, they're doing okay. The last one is sometimes called, I call it a struggling or difficult is the word that's used, whereas a child or a young uh, or, um, or an adolescent struggles to adjust to their environment, whether it's a new school or the church uh, youth group or their new sporting team, right? Um, temperament is critical. And that's why I say with permissive parenting, you might have a child that's easy going and you can guide him or her, but not every child is going to be that way. And so I tell parents, whether you're authoritarian, authoritative, permissive, or a combination, you really have to look at the temperament of the child, and you have to look at the temperament of the adult. Uh, I talked about earlier as an example. was was a family I worked with in North Carolina when I was down in North Carolina, and the child was easygoing, the mother was easygoing, but the father had a very difficult uh, style uh, temperament, and he projected that energy onto the child, so the child would get stressed out, not because the child was that way, but the parent was that way. So there is this reciprocal relationship between the parent and the child. Now, I'm giving you three examples of parenting. So I want to hear from you. What do you think? How was your family? How were you raised? Or if you work with children right now, what do you see? Or you have your own children. So let's start with Lexi. Go ahead, Lexi. So I grew up mostly with my mom. Uh, my parents divorced when I was four. And I think she was pretty authoritative. She, um, once I was about six or seven, she would like tell us pretty much like we had a choice and like let me choose kind of, but like tell me what would be the better option, I think. Um, yeah. So, and then I play grandma a lot. And I think she's more definitely authoritarian, but, um, not I don't think either of them is like better or worse than one or the other. I think they're pretty similar in their okay. own like respects. Yeah. Thanks, Lacey. Thanks. Um Joe, you wanna go, Joe? Um, so I grew up um with both my parents and they were very strict. Um we weren't really allowed I mean we were allowed to play with friends, but we weren't allowed to leave our family property. Um, they drove us to and from school. They just were very protective. And so I guess I would be authoritative. Or the first one, authoritarian. Authoritarian, yes. Um, so yeah, just really strict uh, Sicilian parents who wanted to keep us inside a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was kind of my upbringing. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Joe. Connor? Sure. Hi. Okay. So, um, I this is something that I'm really passionate about is parenting. I've been a nanny for since I was 13 and just watched a lot of different families parent. And um, I grew up definitely in authoritative with authoritative parents. Um, I was the youngest of two, and I've two or of three, and I've two older brothers. So I was the only girl and the youngest. 
So it surprises me that they weren't authoritarian because I was, they were very protective, but they were really good at kind of balancing that and um, giving me kind of a voice in the parenting, but then also, you know, guiding me along the way. So I feel very strongly that authoritative is um, definitely the best balance in parenting because I think kids do need a voice in, you know, the decisions they make in the, even their discipline. I think it's good to give kids the choice of how they're disciplined in some, in some situations. Um, so, yeah. Well, going with that, Carter, how many folks have ever experienced like a uh, punitive style uh, discipline? You were, you were spanked. I was. So we're raising our hand. <laughs> so one, so, two, three, four, four out right, of five. Right. Now, the misconception in the United States is that it's illegal to spank now, but actually that's not the case. A lot of states, um, they'll say that you can use that type of uh, uh, discipline uh, within reason. Um, we talked about this in the last session that there, even though a person might be spanked, we know through research, and in my case, not just research, through my work, and now as a parent, I don't spank as a parent. There are other methods that can be better in the long run than, than the spanking. And in my case, my boys, I don't, I've never spanked them before, but I've created an, an environment from uh, myself and my wife, uh, a discipline. Um, my friends joke around and they call it Latino parenting because um, we're strict with our kids, but we give them the consequences as you were explaining. Um, and so that, in my opinion, would work a lot better than my mom in the fly swatter. My mother used to use a fly swatter and uh, she was quite crafty with the shoe too she could when I got to be a teenager she could, she could throw a shoe across the way and it hit me in the in the back or something um, so I always tell parents you know they're you know we're always learning to be parents and we talked about it earlier about how we don't want to judge parents and we want to help parents and we actually have a class if you're a major or a minor or even if you just want to take the class because you want to learn we have a class it's called families and the parenting process and the whole class is dedicated to working with students and teaching students on how to develop parental parental curriculum and parental programs because one of the big areas to work in the community or in school environments is the parenting process. And a lot of our students, they're going to work with the parenting process. There's no way around it. There's no way around it. So I tell people, learn more about it. So going back, let me see here, Roxanne. Go ahead, go ahead, Roxanne, share with us. Hi, okay. Uh, my parents were permissive. Um, I did anything I wanted. Um, never got spanked. So that led to some consequences as an adult because you don't know how to do a lot of things. Um, so I have a toddler now, and with her, I'm, I'm mostly authoritative. I explain things to her, but there comes a time when I'm the boss, and this, you, you know, you'll do what you're told. Um, but I learned a lot from the way my parents handled me, which was not really at all. <laughs> right. No, and, and you think about it, Roxanne, and you think now that you're a parent, right? You're doing authoritative, right? You said authoritative, right? Um, yeah. The permissive so. parenting can, people will make the argument, well, it's, it's a way for a child to learn and discover the world. And I, and I tell people, it really comes down to the person's environment, obviously, and obviously that child's temperament and the parent's temperament. But, I'm glad to see that you're somewhere in the middle now, the authoritative parenting uh, with your, you say a toddler, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think a lot of the times parents, and I'll be around parents in uh, elementary schools, and people seem to think that the parenting process for some reason starts when the child goes to school. And that's actually not the case. We know that it starts in infancy. You start setting what we call patterns so we can develop behaviors. And we know this because we're looking at brain development, and we know that we continue to develop, and I say we as humans, we continue to develop well into our late teens and early 20s. Our brains are still developing, so they need that guidance. And like you said, Roxanne, you're giving her that guidance. This is authoritative, but also when you say, this is, oh, I'm the boss. I'm obviously a toddler, right? You know? Um, and we want to be what we call development appropriate. And when I was at Michigan State, Dr. Marjorie Castellnik, and this is a long time ago. She was one of the first professors to really champion the development appropriate practices. And so I always tell parents, if you can't parent someone, a child with, who's four years old or a toddler the same as you would a 10-year-old. And I think a lot of times there's this notion that, well, anybody can parent. You just have children and they just parent. I don't believe in a natural instinct. Obviously, there's evolution and there's that sense of fight and flight and to protect and shelter our young. 
but that's not necessarily parenting. That's just an instinct that we've developed over the years. I think in our child ecology class and adult ecology and the adolescent ecology, we learn more about this. But in this class, I think the important thing is to know that there is this idea of the parenting process, but we have to look at it from a global perspective. And I gave the example earlier about where does the baby sleep? Where does the infant sleep when you bring them home him or her from the hospital or if you have the child in the home? Now remember, we're talking about non-Western societies and Western societies. And so a lot of the times people will say, well, you know, Western society, they'll say, well, no, my baby should sleep in the room next to us and we have a, we have a receiver and we're listening to make sure she or he's okay. And then you might have in non-Western societies will say, no, the child should be in the same room with the parents. And so in my case, because I'm somewhere in the middle, because my parents come from Latin country, um, we have this notion that the child should be in the same room with us. Okay. Now, some people would say you're creating dependency and we would say we're creating interdependency and the independence comes from that. I always tell people there is no right or wrong here. This is the global reality. Parents are going to start off with infants, and the first style of parenting is, well, guess what? Where does the baby sleep? Another example of the parenting process that uh, we struggle with as Americans is the breastfeeding process. Um, in the United States, unfortunately, and I use the word unfortunately, in the 70s, we started to encourage mothers not to breastfeed, okay? We went through this whole period in the United States where we didn't need the breastfeeding because we felt that the formula that we were providing was nutritious enough. Well, we know now in the modern era that that's not the case. And um, unfortunately, there is a stigma now for breastfeeding. Yes, breastfeeding is a parenting process because the child bonds with that parent. Um, and so we now are in 2015 and we're wrestling with this because we, we know that often parents don't want to breastfeed, but there is this stigma. Well, if somebody sees you, or what if this, what if, what if you're out and about, what if family comes over to visit? And I think in the non-Western world, a lot of times people breastfeed, but not because of a social class reality, no, because of the nutritious value of breastfeeding and also because of the lack of economic resources uh, from those families. In fact, the World Health Association, excuse me, World Health Organization recommends that a child should be breastfeed well over a year old. And the two, the two. It's two. The United States recommends, uh, the American Pediatric Association recommends about, a, is it a year? Yeah, AAPS1 and WHO is two. So this is from very much from infancy. We see the differences in the parenting style. Something as simple as how you carry a child. In the United States, we don't generally see parents carrying their child on their back. We see them carrying here. And they're here in their arms. You rarely see them carrying a, in a carrier. This is something that's very much foreign to us as Americans. If you go to other parts of the world, you'll see how they carry their child. A lot of it's for, for practical reasons, and the other reasons are for bonding reasons. Now, that's, that's infancy, right? But what about when you get to like adolescence and pre-adolescence? Well, we know that it's distinctly different across the world what it means. First of all, I was saying earlier in the earlier session is that adolescence or, is very much a Western concept. This idea that you go through adolescence. Now, I think the world generally agrees that the, the brain, cognitive development, abstract thinking is very much in that age period. But the concept of going through adolescence, experimenting, making mistakes, or as they say, boys will be boys, which by the way, I've never agreed with that concept because it's very sexist. Um, there is this idea that in the Western world that you can have a testing period between the ages of 12 or 13 to your late teens. Other parts of the world do believe that people are growing in that age, but at the same time, that person's taking on major economic responsibilities for the family, work and all these things. So that's very much um, a debate on what adolescence means. Uh, so let's go back. Let's talk. We've talked about the parenting styles. We've talked about temperament, right? Um, what I want to what I want to ask you now is we're going to shift, right? We're going to talk about gender. Yeah, we can we're going to talk about gender. Okay. Um, I could talk about parenting forever, folks. I, I, since I was a little kid, I was always there to help my mom and my stepmom, but we, we just don't have enough time. What we want to do is we want to talk about gender. We want to hear about gender from you folks. One of the things that I was talking to my colleague, Dr. Trask, and I was kind of picking her brain at the conference, and 
she's a good friend of mine too so it's not just she she wasn't mad at me or anything is that we understand that our society even though we've come a long ways uh in the western society with women's rights women's rights or egalitarian societies where men and women are equal we know that our societies in the world are still very much male oriented okay we know this now this can have major impact on the family life because the woman is not only just caring for the children, but often women nowadays work outside of the home. And the example that was given earlier in the semester was where the woman got up, she made breakfast and lunch for her husband who was going to go to the factory. Then she went, prepared her children, and then she went to the factory. She came home, helped out her children and her parents, and went back to sleep and did it all over again. And the other example we talked about is how more and more women are migrating and immigrating to different parts of the country or different parts of the world to sustain their families, and unlike men who've done that in the past, women are ridiculed and they're criticized as not being strong women and not being good mothers, even though they're trying to do the best for their children. It's almost what we call a double standard. And I'm gonna let Jen jump in because she just did this, uh, did you do uh, uh, video or audio lecture? Video. I'm gonna let Jennifer jump in and she just did this great lecture. Make sure you listen to it. All right, go ahead. All right, so over here. All right, so one of the major things we talked about in um, our gender lecture was is that you have women who are kind of going between these two conflicting ideas. And one of the conflicting ideas is that the woman should be the role of the nurturer, she's the mother, she's supposed to be taking care of her children, and she needs to find fulfillment in that. And then the other idea that you have is that women should be working, contributing to the family financially, and um, honestly, you have some women who just enjoy working and find fulfillment there. So you have these two kind of ideas, like we're trying to find how we can reconcile those. And, um, and part of the issue is, is that we have what's called mother work. And that's work that is mother done work. at home. Mother work, Patricia Hill Collins, Dr. Ruins Fave. Um, so we have mother work that's done at the home. And that's taking care of the home, taking care of the children. Often it can involve um, tracking the family's finances. So you have that stuff that's done at home, and then you have the additional work that the woman does um, outside the home. So you have the unseen, unpaid labor at home, and then you have the work outside the home. So my question for you guys um, to discuss today is, do you think it's possible for us to have equality in these gender roles, um, especially as we see other developing countries who are starting to embrace the idea that women can work outside the home? Is there, is there ever going to be that equality, or are women always going to be doing both sides of the coin? Are they always going to be doing the unseen, unpaid labor and the work outside the home? So what do you guys think? Feel free to, or should I call on you? Or? Let's go with Roxanne. Oh, all right. Roxanne. Ruben says Roxanne. we start over. Hit it, Roxanne. Okay. There we go. Um, it, this is an interesting topic because in my family, the men do a lot of the work. The men do all the cooking. Um, and the women kind of, they're artists and they do what they want. They explore their own um, interests, I should say. And it's not that they're taken care of. They make, they have income. But I think that the family life, the mother work is, is divided by... Wow both people. So I haven't seen it where the woman does mother work plus out work outside the home. It's always split. You have a more egalitarian kind of family style. Yeah. Very cool. So you, you would probably say that, yes, we can do it. It's doable. Well, I don't know. I don't know <laughs> if we can do it. I just know that we do it. It works for you guys, right? Right. <laughs> hey, that'll do. All right, Martha, what do you think? Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think um, I think there's more. Our generation today is growing up with the more of an openness to do equal work. Um, so I feel like maybe it'll take a couple decades to see more families um, being. Uh, I guess, working together to keep the family um, rather than just um, a certain gender. Um, uh, but I do, I feel like it is possible. Um, it'll just take time to, for our society to really look at it in a positive way. And I think you said a good point, that time is critical. When you look at developing countries, there's sometimes the social, political uh, 
influences and that's governing how families how gender is looked at in those countries i think we take it for granted sometimes in our western society that women uh, can be at that point with i'm just saying folks uh, can, women can be in the egalitarian role equal to the man uh, and we talked about in the earlier class how you know the founder of this discipline ellen swallows richards when she had, she called what they call the late classic meetings in new york they got together to develop this discipline you know women at the time couldn't even vote now that's 100 plus years ago but we look at developing countries like jen said and there are still women who, if they go to work, they're not maybe they're not even criticized. They could be in danger because of the way society is structured. And so I, I tell people we don't bring, we don't judge other societies. But at the same time, we don't look at and make excuses. And say, well, it's a person's culture, it's a person's religion. We know that most, like for example, the three major religions in the world right now, Islam and Judaism and Christianity, that there is room for egalitarianism in those religions. I often tell people it's the social political factors that are governing the gender familial roles in the family. So I like what you said about time. I think we can change. And I hope it doesn't take 100 years like it did in the United States. I hope it takes less time in the world. Well, and it's interesting because as we look at some of the other developing countries or developed countries around the world, one of the ones that we referenced in our lectures was Japan. And in Japan, we talked about how um, if you watch the Japanese families lectures, it's a big, it's it's a it's a issue in Japan, um, the issue of gender equality in the workplace. Women can't get as good benefits as men; they don't get paid as much. And in fact, what we see in um, Japan is that a lot of Japanese women leave. They leave the country because they they just know that there aren't really good opportunities for them. So they come to places like the United States or Canada. And, um, and that is gonna affect families on a global level because you've got Japanese women who are leaving. And so all of a sudden there aren't as many um, spouses or as many women in the pool for people to choose from for spouses. And um, you've got, there's just, it, it's just kind of a trickle down effect that goes throughout the whole entire country. So, all right, Joe, you're the, you and Dr. Rubin are the lone males in our group today. What do you have to say? What do you think about gender? Well, touching on the Japan lecture, um, I think, you know, they also talked about how they gave, you know, paternal leave and a lot of the Japanese uh, men refused to take it, mostly yeah. because they feel that they didn't have a place in the home. Um, it was almost foreign to them since they work so much. Um, but in the U.S., I think maybe, you know, if we have... Um, maybe more of an equal pay between men and women in the workforce, then um, maybe the home life will, will mimic that more. But I'm not too certain, so. No, that's good, Joe. Go ahead, keep going, keep going. Oh, I was just gonna say, yeah, I think you're right. And it's interesting that, yeah, I mean, in the United States, we're, we're definitely, I mean, we're down way low on the, on the uh, how much maternity leave we grant, because I mean, I, I believe maternity leave is about four to six weeks. I believe I think that's about yeah it's roughly about right there and um and, and so that's for the mother and it, when my husband was uh when our two sons were born he was able to take leave but it had to be his own like he had to take either personal leave or sick leave it wasn't just granted to him and that I mean that was the week that he was able to spend with our sons that was is really important to us and really important to their development as well so yeah I think it's really interesting that the uh the U.S. doesn't offer paternity leave and that japan is like trying to get people they're like begging the fathers in japan to take this paternity leave and they won't take it they just um there's there's just that stigma there of taking paternity leave it's really interesting all right lexi how are you doing down there um good so this is like something i've been thinking about kind of a lot um my current boyfriend has a two-year-old daughter and um his mom has been a stay-at-home mom and so, like, he always thought whoever he, like, ended up with would be, like, a stay-at-home mom. But, like, I'm almost done with my bachelor's degree. So, like, if we stayed together, that would, like, never happen. And um, so, like, I think it's possible, but I think it would, like, take a lot of work to have, like, equal, like, sharing of, you know, the mother work or whatever. Yeah, I think it's interesting because, I mean, your boyfriend's mom was kind of, probably part of that generation where it was just starting for women to go into the workplace and starting for that to be, um, to be more acceptable for women to work yeah. in the workplace. And so, and like Martha said, I think it's going to be a few generations before we kind of 
get out of this mentality that women have to stay at home and we get to where it's more acceptable for yes, women can go outside and be outside the workplace or outside the home and in the workplace. And in the United States, uh, women are starting to outperform men in their academics. Uh, women are outperforming men in the job, uh, in the industry, uh, in the sciences, in the medicine and engineering. It's just we haven't caught up yet in the sense of one of the students said earlier about the 75 cents to the dollar for women. Uh, and uh, that was a European American woman and the Latino, excuse me, the Asian and African American woman were uh, like 69 or something, Latino women were right under that. So we're still not at it from a financial standpoint, but I think in, in a country like the United States, we're definitely moving in the right direction from when we started this back in the 1850s. When we look at developing countries, they're just starting. I mean, we're at 170 years in, and in developing countries, women are just starting to get to that point. Women have sacrificed um, their lives to, to in, the, in the recent years. If you just look in the last five years and 10 years, uh, Nobel Peace Prize, right? Uh, women sacrificing for, for, for young girls to learn and to be educated, formally educated. So I think that when we look at women and gender in the family, it's also that exosystem, the policies that are written around this is a it's, it's not just something that people say okay well that's just men and women and their children no it's our societies who make these decisions and these policies are processed and become laws i think that's critical to understand and i think a good example i'm gonna give you folks an extra credit and uh the extra credit works in a way where what you do is you write up a page page and a half double space okay double space um and what you do is you write based on what we're learning in class okay and your readings both and that includes audio and video lectures, readings, or anything, tech talks or whatever. A good example in the United States of, uh, that happened was in uh, Minnesota. And this film is now, you can probably watch it for free online. It's called North Country. And North Country was a film that came out about a woman who was trying to get a job at the local mine, like mining. And, there was, and I don't want to ruin it for you, but it really delves into the microsystem, the mesosystem, the exosystem, what that company, the policies that company had, and uh, macrosystem, our beliefs on what women can and what could not, they, they could not do. And, and it's a great, it's a great film. This one? Um, yeah, North Country. Okay, I'll uh, put a link on Canvas. Uh, Jen's going to put a link on Canvas for you. Um, it's great extra credit. Um, do that film. Uh, it's a good example of this notion of where women are at and where women are going. It's an American example, okay? Now, what, I, what we can do is, you know, we're gonna give you a couple more extra credits. The folks in 2200, the other class have a couple more. I'm like, we gotta make sure that everybody has equal number of extra credits. Um, Jen can come up with another example that's more global, besides the United States, on how women have come to be, uh, you know, known. Obviously in Argentina, you know, eventually we had a female leader, right? Uh, you know. Uh, uh, um, and Mexico uh, and other countries in the world, we've had examples where women, they fought for, for not just the rights of their, themselves and children, but families and society, okay? So um, this is one example in the United States, okay? What we're gonna do now is we're gonna transition, and we've got about 10 minutes left roughly, and to protect your time, um, hey, let me, Excuse me, I'm going to, take, to ask them about their papers if they need help. Okay, do you guys have any questions? Or, um, I know we can't discuss your individual grades on Zoom since there's, you know, four other people listening in. But if you guys have any questions about your papers or about any of the assignments, I can answer those now. So. I have a question about the um, interview paper. Yeah, what's up, Connor? Yeah, um, so we were talking about it before you guys got on here. They have <laughs> want dialogue or he doesn't want dialogue from the interview is that correct so how do we That's make right. so he doesn't want like quotations what he wants you to do is just kind of tell the story and so like for example instead of saying so then connor said blah 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 blah. i would say like she described her childhood growing up in ethiopia or not you grew up in uh madrid and she described her life in madrid and talked about this 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 and this and um, one of the, I remember some of the feedback that we got about the paper last semester was that a lot of people were saying, I can't get to five pages, this is a lot. Yeah. So you really want to, um, when you're doing your interview with people, really make sure you get them to go into lots of detail, ask follow-up questions as necessary in order to make sure that you have enough material to get to five pages. 
Is this, they, the interview? this is the interview. They were just asking about. Um, so you don't want quotations. You want them to just tell the story. Tell the without story. Quotation. You can paraphrase it, and actually that benefits you because one of the students earlier was asking about you know if we can use class references, right, and stuff. If you want to, you can in, you can inject something that you learned in class. Are you recording? Yeah. Excuse me. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so. <laughs> Man, there's nothing like doing a recording to make Dr. Rubin the most popular office on the uh, on the block. So, all right. So, did that answer your question, Connor? Did that help? Okay, good. What else? What other questions can I answer for you guys? Crickets. This is a good thing. No, no. Now is your chance. If you wanna, if you wanna vent about assignments, or if you guys have any feedback about the course, you can give it to me now. While Rubin's not in the room. Shh. It's your chance. All right. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on and post a couple of extra credits up on Canvas. So be on the lookout for those. Um, what it is is I'll give you a list of, let's see, what did I do? Okay, I did, I'll do two. I did the one that Ruben just said with the North Country. And then I've got a list of movies that you can view um, for extra credit. And you may have seen them already. I've, I got, let's see, what have I got on there? Rabbit Proof Fence is one. Uh, Bend It Like Beckham. Always a classic, really good. Um, and then the other one is you can write a one-page summary of courtship traditions and practices from another country. Um, and of course, uh, with just like with everything you turn in in this class, it needs to be an APA style formatting. And also, if you are doing one of the assignments where you watch a movie, don't just describe the movie to us. We've seen them. We know what they are. That's why we put them on there. But you'll want to make sure you use concepts from class to tell us why you think we might have chosen these movies um, for you to view. And so you can use ecological systems theory, family systems theory. You can talk about how it relates to lectures like the gender lecture or um, uh, the aging lecture or any of the other lectures. Notice I only said my lectures. But um, uh, so any other questions? Any questions about extra credit? Wow, you guys are so easy. Oh, wait, I see Roxanne, you're raising your hand. I see. <laughs> like, wait, wait. That little that audio button. There you are, right. there you are. So, okay. okay, so I'm just looking at the upcoming assignments tab on Canvas. And yeah. so our family's interview paper is due the second, but per an email I just had with you, our research paper is due on the third now. Ah. You, um, that's right, you and Lexi joined the class late. So you guys are, oh. we have some great news for you. Your papers are delayed until July 7th. So you have until the 7th. Yes, we're gonna give you guys some extra time. I know we've been kind of piling on the work and the class is really quick. And plus there's a holiday weekend in the mix there. So um, we just wanted to give you guys a few extra days to just really make sure that we get good papers from you and not just this like last minute craziness. So. Your papers are going to be delayed to the 7th, and that is, um, you guys are the first ones we've told, first ones we've told today, so that is going to be going in on Canvas. Um, I'm going to, we're going to post the announcement right after this. And another thing I want to tell you guys about next week is that the Zoom, the second Zoom lecture, is going to be canceled. Um, we just had some scheduling issues on Dr. Rubin's end that we weren't able to resolve. So that is in your favor. I'm sure you guys are really bummed about, you know, not having to get the Zoom with us again. But there will be a voice thread prompt, so you will have the voice thread prompt for next week. And I'm also going to post an exam study guide. And this time for the exam study guide, I'm going to post it as a discussion. So if you have questions about the exam, you should be able to ask those questions on the discussion thread. And we should that way we're not getting like 50 emails because often when we get lots of emails, then they get stuck down in the queue and we don't get to them as quickly or they get missed. So the discussion I think will be a lot easier for you guys uh, format wise to ask us questions about the exam. Um, do you guys have any questions about the exam that I can answer now or um, any other questions about either the papers or the voice threads or the, if you want to bemoan the fact that there's no Zoom next week, I can, I can handle that. Did you, you mentioned that you did a gender video lecture. Was that before or is that coming up? Because I know that I just. Is this week. It was just posted. Oh, okay. Um, I believe it was posted, modified. Yes, it's on, it's on the modules. Just click on gender and globalization in module three. And it should have the link up there and the PowerPoint 
file is also located in the PowerPoints folder on the class files section. Okay, got it. Okay. I have a question about the material that we read and watched this week. Yeah. So we're not going to have a video prompt and there's no quiz or anything. So that will just be for the next quiz? That's correct. So okay. it'll be on exam two. Okay. So you'll want to watch for, um, just look for when we post the exam two study guide when module four is unlocked, then you'll want to just look and make sure you have all the information that you, um, from that exam two study guide. Okay. Cool. Great. Any feedback on the study guide from last time? Was it helpful, not helpful? Helpful, I see nods. Nods are helpful. Good. Very helpful. <laughs> all right, um, anything else, guys? We're, we've got about three minutes left, so if you guys are good, oh, hold on, I'll let Dr. Ruben finish up. We went yeah, over the sorry. study guide, we went over PowerPoints, we went over lectures, extra credit. I mean, man, I think we covered everything. Very good, good, good. See, and remember, um, uh, don't hesitate. Uh, I know one of the students earlier was saying, well, can, if I need to talk, you know, can I call or Skype or Zoom? I mean, technically we got a week left, but we gave you the extension, the five day extension to do the papers, but don't hesitate. I mean, you know, okay, Dr. Ben, can, can I talk to you about this? Um, and I'm, this is the number to call me, whatever the case. Um, or if you want to do the Zoom or the Skype, if you want to see face to face, right? You want to see the person. Um, we want you to succeed in this course. We know that it's tough. It's four weeks, and you've been doing well up until now. So we want you to finish it strong. Um, do the readings, do the lectures, and now that you have those extra five days, you don't have to stress out so much about the paper and the exam at the same time. Right. Well, listen, have a good evening, and uh, be safe, and we look forward to hearing from you. And the extra Thank credit you. is available as of right now in the week three module. Boom, it's done. Uh, Thanks guys for tuning in, we appreciate it. And you should see this reflected in your grade today. So I'm putting them in. Thank you. Thank you. That's Thank a lot of points. That's yeah, that's gonna, that, don't worry about those exam grades so much because this is gonna help. <coughs> it's all based on the papers, folks. The exam grade, uh, you do well in your papers, you do your grades, and you have to class that you did today, and you'll do well. All right? Okay, hang in there. Thank you. Thank you. Later. Thank you. I'm going to end the meeting. Stop recording.